What's up, everybody? And welcome to another episode. Hit the like button, subscribe to my channel, and share the video. Hit the join button and become a member. Why? Well, members get exclusive content. Hit the bell icon on my channel so that you'll receive a notification every time I drop a video. Let's get into it. This transpired in Sentinella State Prison. Had to have been 2019. I know because I got out of the hole in 2019. I arrived at Sentinella in 2017. And again, I paroled in 2022. 2019, I went to the hole. And when I got out, I was in a certain cell in five block. That's how I know that that's when this situation here transpired. And this was the Southsiders. A Southsider on Southsider. Vicious and brutal attack. I brought you a similar story in the past that transpired in High Desert. And the reason that it transpired, the story is similar in that a Southsider hit the yard saying that he was the head honcho. He was the main Southsider. I know this because after the incident, a close buddy of mine that was a Southsider ran down to me why they brutally attacked this guy. I, I was there. I, I didn't witness the attack with my eyes because it transpired inside of the cell. But I, I was on top of the cell and the dude was on the bottom of the cell so I heard everything in an event and I saw him when he came out. But the dude say, my, my partner said, that dude hit the yard. Now, I don't know their politics. And so I don't know what would cause a Southsider to hit the yard saying that he's now the man. I'm going to assume that they are enticed and lured by the power aspect of being the leader. Because, of course, a leader of the Southsiders, they live a lavish life if you will, inside of prison. You know, they get certain stipends, they get certain money from the collective, they have a lot of money, they have a lot of power. With that comes a lot of responsibility, which is why, which is why some of them come up unalived. Bad decisions. So I'm not, it's not really an enviable position to be in. But he wanted to be in the position. This is someone, he was only there for a few days, but he seemed to carry himself like someone with prestige, someone who did command respect. I can recognize certain ones that are the head honchos. And again, I believe he may have came out of the shoe program. I'm not 100% sure, however. Wherever he came from, he hit the yard, according to my partner, and let it be known that he's taken over the yard, that he is the man now, and that everyone <clears throat> must report to him. <clears throat> the nerve, the audacity, because if this is untrue, then the real shot caller naturally is going to take umbrage and is not going to relinquish his position to someone who is undeserving. Someone, he, he's the man, not him. This guy that's hitting the yard talking about He's the new man. But he had the temerity to hit the yard and say it anyway. Now, perhaps he was justified. When I say I don't know their politics, I don't know all of the intricacies. Of course, I know of a lot of their a lot of their politics. I know enough to survive. I know I know enough to make it home. But I'm not privy to everything that they have going on. And so again, I don't know who this guy was, but apparently they didn't agree with this and felt like he was some sort of imposter. Whatever homework they did on him, they discovered that he indeed was not some head honcho and some big shot caller and that they indeed would not be listening to him. And in fact, apparently the decision was made that he had to be removed, not just from the yard, but from the face of the earth. 
And not long after he hit the yard, at day room recall one day, it was about 2.30, uh, 3 p.m. in the afternoon, they hit his cell. They hit everybody's cell that was out there in day room. Now, he hadn't come out for day room, but his cell he had. Apparently, the fix was in. And when they hit his cell at day room recall, well, two Southsiders ran inside of the cell with murderous intentions. And they got inside and closed the door behind them. Now, there's a lot of commotion, a lot of noise at day room recall. People are stopping to pick up stuff. People are saying their goodbyes. There's a lot of commotion. Everybody's locking it up at one time. An opportune time to take care of business. And they ran in there, and I was inside of my cell, so I did not have a visual. I was on the top tier, and dude was on the bottom. But I can hear an attack transpire inside of the cell. I've heard many cell fights. I've had a couple. And you have your lockers right here with, you know, with your clothes and your deodorant and soap in there. And the bunk is right here. These cells are not big. And the bunk is right here. Oftentimes, you're bumping up against the bunk or the locker during the fight. And if you make it to the door, which is not hard to do because the cells are so small, then the door really makes a lot of noise when you're banging up against the door and all that. So we always know when a cell fight is going on. You can hear it all the way around the tier when a cell fight is going on for the most part. And when they ran in there, that's all I heard was lockers banging, the door banging because they had closed the door behind them. And the dude had tried to make a couple of screams, a couple of faint screams. But it didn't work because apparently they was on him Viciously, they brutally attacked him. <clears throat> I know this because when he, <clears throat> when the attack was finally over, and I mean finally, because it took a while for the police to even get there because of all of the commotion at day room recall. Looking back on it, I think the Southsiders was making a little bit more commotion, taking their time getting back in the cell, already knowing what was about to transpire. Basically, they were creating an illusion, a distraction to give them time to take care of the business. So it took the police a while to even get to, to realize something that was going on inside of that cell and to get there. And by the time they did, apparently it was damn sure too late because medical rushed over. The police ran in there to get them. And they said, oh, my God, I just hear the police saying, oh, call medical, call medical now. Now, like, they didn't even want to drag him out of the cell. They waited to, for medical to come to see if it was anything that they can do. And medical ran in there, and they lift him, lifted him up and put him upon the stretcher. And when they wheeled him out, I was on my door looking down to see him. Everyone, everyone was. You know, it's just like when you see an accident, a car accident, you often turn around to see, to see it, to see what happened. It's just human nature. And when he's coming out on the stretcher, we're all on our door and we're looking. And his face is opened up. Hell, his neck was opened up. His, it, it, he had a shirt on, but they would start, it, they had begin to cut the shirt off. And they was pumping on him. They was trying to pump his chest right there in the day room because I, I, I'm assuming they felt like they didn't have enough time to even rush him right across the yard to medical and perform these life-saving maneuvers that they had to apply them right now or he didn't have a chance. So right there in the day room, while we're all right there on our cell doors, they're trying to bring him back to life. And he's a bloody brutal mess. He is non-responsive. And I knew in that moment that he wasn't coming back because I can see his face was opened up and the wounds on his neck were grotesque. I had to turn away. I couldn't even stomach it. 
And they did indeed eventually rush him out to medical. And we received word, we're talking 10 to 15 minutes later, that he was no more. That he had indeed passed away from his injuries. And, you know, they took the Southsiders that had performed this exercise, they took them to the hole. And that was that. And later on that night, I did think, I thought about it. And I realized, again, that this is not a game. That everyone has to be mindful of what they do and how they do it behind those walls. But in life, period. The, the decisions that we make really determine our future and our fate. And one has to be mindful. And I did feel some regret for him. I did think about the phone call that his family was about to receive. Just like I thought about Flacco when he was unalive there in the shoe program in Corcoran. And I thought about his family because he was 19 or 20 years old. And this dude here was older, of course. But he, he had a mother, I'm sure, a father, sister, brother, son, and daughter. And I can only imagine my family receiving a phone call saying that I was brutally unalive in the cell and that I would not be coming home. And that instead, in fact, began to prepare for my funeral. You know, I thought about that that night. And, uh, <clears throat> and that's why I'm cautious and I try to carry myself with a certain amount of, of honor and respect and make the proper decisions, and we should all do the same. But, yeah, that's what happened. He hit the yard. This happened in 2019. You can look it up. It was in five block. That's where I was at. And the logistics of it, I don't know all of it, but I do know that he had said that he was the man. And my boy had told me that the police knew that they was about to go in there and unalive him. I sw that's what he told me. Not that they was particularly in on it, but he said, man, the police knew that this dude hit the yard. They know who the, who the, who the guy is. Every administration knows who the head honcho is on the yard from every faction, bro, period. They know who the head honcho is. So he said for this dude to hit the yard, now saying that he is the head honcho, the police knew that this was not going to go over well. That something was going to happen to this dude. They knew it. That not just a removal. The call was going to be made to unalive him. You have different disciplines. You have a two-on-one, a beatdown. You have a sticking where it is a removal. And then you have calls that, that are made to brutally unalive you. Period. He cannot walk away from this situation. Y'all get that done or it's y'all's ass if y'all can't get this done. He has to be unalive. And so the police knew that the call for this sort of infraction would be to unalive him. That he could not make it off the yard. Because he can't go to another yard and pull off this same nonsense saying that he's the head guy. They want, they're going to want to know how come he wasn't eliminated on the yard before? So, so that they would now have to deal with this nonsense. So he wasn't never going to make it off of that yard. And he did not. Again, I didn't have a visual. But I know from his faint screams that were nightmare inducing. And looking at his body, which for sure was nightmare inducing. One had to turn away because the scene was so gory. Whatever decisions he made, apparently they were ill-advised. Be back at y'all soon with more content. Stay free, people!